Hey, if you have a Bible with you, uh, please uh, turn with me to Exodus chapter 16. Um, we, are, we are going to be covering from Exodus chapter 15, verse 22, to the end of chapter 16, but we're going to take our reading from chapter 16. And if you don't have a Bible this morning, there are Bibles out in the seats that you are welcome to use. Um, and if you don't have a Bible of your own, you're welcome to take that Bible. But here's the thing. If you would like, if you are going to take that Bible, let me invite you to take that Bible over to the Welcome Center after, the, after worship and trade it in for a nicer Bible. Um, we, we love to give the word. God, we believe and we know actually that God has commanded us to be hungry for his word and we want to share that word with you. And so the only, the only caveat is that you, you don't bring it back. It's your Bible now. So we, we're glad to be able to give that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. As we, as we dive back into the story this morning, um, at, if you remember last week we, we left Israel at, the, at the, the shore of the sea after God had defeated Egypt once and for all and they were singing a song of victory and... Man, and that was it. I mean, they had seen all of God's mighty acts. They had seen, they had been brought through the sea. And, and that was it. That was all the evidence they ever needed. They, they lived happily ever after. Right? No. No. Immediately, we run into problems. And so, uh, we, while we are out of the, uh, have come out of the story of God Pulling Israel and, and redeeming Israel from slavery in Egypt. This story that all along has been about God being made known. Um, we're still in that same story. We're leaving Egypt behind. But the problems, are just, the problems for Israel in some ways are just beginning here. Now there's a ton. We're going to get... Chapter 16 is about when God... Gave, the, gave Israel manna in the wilderness, gave them bread from heaven and fed them in the wilderness. And there's a ton that we can say about this. We could, we could legitimately read chapter 16 for the next three or four weeks and I could give you three or four very different sermons. Uh, we're not going to do that. Um, but I just want to, I just want to say that because we're, we're going to look at one specific thing and, and it has to do with this overall theme that we've been seeing. Uh, throughout the story, that God is making himself known. And now we're, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into that. See, God is worthy of all honor and praise. Amen? And he wants us to know him. That's what this whole story is about. But we, we, we have to wrestle with the fact that we can never really know him as he is until we grasp and we understand that his very heart is to do us good. I want you to hear that again. We're never going to really understand and know who he is as he is until we grasp hold of the fact that he intends to do his people good. That's a truth that you need to know and that the world needs to know. And, and honestly, guys, the... If as, as I look out at the landscape of our world and our, and our culture, it's the, the pushback against Christianity isn't, isn't just the, the, the question of whether God exists. It's whether Christianity is good. It's whether God is good. It's whether it's moral or not. And so we need to wrestle with this. And we need to come to firm conviction about the goodness of the goodness of God and the goodness of, of what he has for us. So chapter 16, we're going to start reading in verse 13, okay? I'm going to read through verse 30. I'm, I'm sorry, we're going to start in verse 11, not verse 13. Hear the word of the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat. And in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. 
In the evening, quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning, dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. When the people saw it, they said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it, each one of you, as much as he can eat. You shall take an omer according to the number of persons that each of you has in his tent. And the people of Israel did so. They gathered, some more, some less. But when they measured it with an omer, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat. And Moses said to them, let no one leave any of it over till morning. But they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it till morning, and it bred worms and stank. And Moses was angry with them. Morning by morning they gathered it, each as much as he could eat. But when the sun grew hot, it melted. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers each. And when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, this is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil. And all that is left over lay aside to be kept till the morning. So they laid it aside till the morning as Moses commanded them. And it did not stink and there were no worms in it. Moses said, eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is a Sabbath, there will be none. On the seventh day, some of the people went out to gather, but they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Remain each of you in his place. Let no one go out of his place until on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. This is the word of the Lord. Father, your, your word declares in so many different ways your goodness. The Lord, we... I confess even the truth of my own heart is I have, I have such a weak grasp on that. And it's only, but it's only when we come to know that, that, you're, that you are good and you, from your very heart, intend good for your people, that we come to really understand who you are. We understand and, and know you as healer and faithful and, and love we can't know you outside of, outside of knowing you and trusting that you want the good for your people. And so we ask that you would open our eyes to that this morning. I ask that for those who are in Christ and are, are by, with the help and the pow- under the power of your Holy Spirit are, are living repentant lives and and seeking to more and more to obey you and to grow up in Christ. Lord, strengthen us with this knowledge. Deepen that knowledge and, and make it deeper and wider and broader and, and help, it to, help it to fill up our understanding of you so that when we hunger for your word and when we consume it, that we would, we would really be satisfied in it. And Lord, I ask that for those who, in here who, who don't know Jesus, and aren't following him, that you would, you would, and maybe are questioning whether you are actually good, whether your commands are good, that you would reveal yourself. You are the living God, and we, and we praise you, and we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so, so as we pick up the story here, the, the, Israel goes out into the wilderness. They go from the sea out into the wilderness. And as they do, remember, they went out there without provisions. The Exodus 12, 39 will come up here on the screen, I think. Um, at, remember, this is on the night of the Passover, they, they were thrown out of Egypt, not just walked out of Egypt. And they went out without any provision at all. 
It says that in chapter 16 that they came to a certain part of the wilderness uh, on the 15th day of the second month after they had left Egypt. Now, depending on how you interpret that and, and, and how you read that, that's anywhere from 30 to 60 days after, after the night of the Passover. Well, let me just, just, let's put this in perspective. How long does it take several hundred thousand people who left home without provision to be out in the wilderness and to get a little itchy about it? It doesn't take 30 to 60 days. So, as, as you might think, why didn't Israel get it? Um, think about how angry you get if you, haven't, if you skipped lunch. Um, and, and maybe we can, we can put some of that in perspective. Uh, but from the sea, in, in chapter 15, we're, like if you're looking, if you just page back in chapter 15, verse 22 and following, we see that the, that the people of Israel went three days out into the wilderness and they came to this place called Mara. Mara, which means bitterness. And it was called that because the water there was bitter. In other words, it wasn't drinkable. And they said, what shall we drink? This is great. There's water. We can't drink it. That's awesome. Here's what it says in, in verse 25. Moses cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a log, and he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. Now, I don't know exactly the mechanics of that or, or why it is that a log made, uh, made water that couldn't be drunk potable, but that's, it's, it doesn't explain it for us. So there you go. That's how, that's how God dealt with it. He, ta- he, he took what was bitter and made it sweet. He takes water that would do harm to his people and he heals it. And then, then he says this. The Lord, then it says this. The Lord made for them a statue and a rule. And there he tested them, saying, If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord, your healer. Now we've got to pay attention to this carefully because I think our tendency, if your tendency is like mine, is to, is to read that as God saying, I will only heal you if you do these things for me. That's not what he's saying, though. God's saying, you will only know me as healer if you do this. You can't know me, you can't know me as healer if you won't obey my commands. That phrase, what is right in God's eyes, that what is right in his eyes, that's important here. Remember, if, you, if you've ever read the Bible, you'll know what I'm talking about. When Israel actually finally gets to the land 40 years later, the thing that characterizes their behavior in the land is that everyone does what is right in his own eyes. They live and they act and have the character of a people who think I know better than God what is right for me. Does that sound familiar? We don't have to look outside of these walls to know, to, to know the truth of that in our, in our own lives, right? But that, that also seems to, be the, seems to be the mantra of our age. And honestly, I think if you, if you look back at preaching, Christian preaching from the last 2,000 years, Every, every Christian preacher coming to this passage is going to say the same thing about their own age. We are not unique in that. But we have to understand that that is the truth about us. That we, we think we know better than God himself what's right for me. But the Lord, the Lord desires for, him to, for, for his people to know him. And know him as healer. Not just almighty God, but as healer, as protector, as provider. But that means that his people must accept, we must accept God as he is. He is God, for one. That means, if he is God, that means we aren't. Right? We are not God. Thank God for that. It's not until, it's not until we trade in our autonomous, self-righteous lives and by self-righteousness, I mean, I mean the way that we, the, 
that we get to define the terms. That's what self-righteousness is. We get to define the terms of what is right. It's not until we trade those things in for God's true righteousness that we can actually see God for who he is. This story, I've already said it, is still about knowing God. And it will continue to be. And now for the, you, we need to come to know that, that to, to experience and to know God as he is requires that we receive something from his hand. We receive gift, uh, gifts from his hand. And we receive them on his terms. And we receive them for our good. That's what we're going to see in, in chapter 16. And I think that's what chapter 15 is actually getting at. That's what the testing is. So in chapter 16, they're out in the wilderness. And for the second time since they left the sea, the people grumble against Moses and Aaron. This time it's the whole congregation that do, does it. Pay attention to what they say when they grumble. Chapter 16 now, if you look at verse 3. The people of Israel said to them, said to Moses and Aaron, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. Now, look, in its giving them the benefit of the doubt here, like that speaks to something pretty obvious. Better to die quickly than to go out into the wilderness and starve to death. But I think that there's something a lot more corrupt about what they are saying here. And, and the accusation that they're leveling, they think at Moses, but really at God. They're saying better that God would not have passed over our homes. Better that God would not have, have covered over our sin when he came in wrath on Egypt. Better to not be God's people than to be in our present state of fear and anxiety. It's better to, it would be better to not be called his sons and daughters than to, to be his in the way that he was demanding. But how does God respond? Look at verse 4. This is immediately how God responds to this grumbling to this grumbling and this accusation. The Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you. That's how God responds. That is amazing. God's response to the grumbling and their sin and their unbelief is a gift. Now, for those of you, for, for those of us in here who are, who are a little bit more apt to think, it would be easier to actually believe God if we saw the heavens part and fire come down, or, or if we saw writing on the wall, or something like that. that. Then it would be easy. We have to reckon with the fact that to actually really know God is to simply receive from his hand. He makes himself known and he overcomes unbelief with gifts to his people. With grace, actually. Grace isn't, isn't just uh, this amorphous thing. Grace is the disposition that God has toward the ungodly. It's the not being based on any merit of our own or any, any works of our own. God's disposition towards us is grace. And God says he gave this, he's giving this gift to test them. Whether they will obey, they will walk in my law or not. Again, don't understand that. It's not that God is testing them so that he will know something he doesn't already know. God knows what the truth is in our hearts. He always does. He's testing to draw out the reality of his people's hearts and to transform it. That's what God testing, uh, testing from God does. Draws out the reality of our hearts so that God can transform it. 
First of all, let's, let's talk about one thing, one mistake that the, the Israelites continue to make, and they will continue to make this. It's going to get them in real trouble later. When they keep, they keep confusing Moses for God. So when, when they are ready to grumble, they're coming to Moses and Aaron and saying, look what you did. You brought us out here to die. You brought us out here to starve, to, to, to die of thirst. But it wasn't Moses that sent the plagues on Egypt. And it wasn't Moses that made, made dry land appear in the middle of the sea. Moses keeps telling them, it's not me and Aaron. It's not me and Aaron that you're accusing here. It's God. And to prove that very point, in, that's what's going on here in, in verses 9 to, 11, or 9 to 12 in, in chapter 16. Let me just read it to you. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked towards the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in a cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the, Mos- of the people of Israel. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. He made it completely plain and clear beyond all doubt that it was he and not Moses that was doing this. When God provides for their need, there can be no confusion about this. So, God rains bread from heaven upon them. They wake up in the morning and they see this flaky, frost-like thing. And they don't even know what it is. And they went out and they gathered it every morning. Three, at least three times that I counted as we read this morning, it said they went out and gathered as much as, as they could eat. As much as they could eat. That means he's not having his people exist on, on rations, on, on just like bread and water and, and just enough to sustain life. No, they are, being, they are eating to the fill. So there's plenty. And it was their daily bread. When we pray the Lord's Prayer and we ask for our daily bread, it, think of this. They weren't supposed to leave any of it till the next day. God was commanding them to trust Him that just as He provided today and gave them bread, He's going to do again tomorrow. And as He's doing that, He's training them to know Him. But the people didn't listen to Moses, did they? They tried to keep some till the next morning and it bred worms and it stank. And Moses gets angry. And then, God, but God gave them manna like this day after day for six days. And then on the sixth day, God told them to gather double. So that they would, they would have as much as they could eat on the next day too. The Sabbath. When he wouldn't send manna. And God commanded them to rest. Every man, woman, and child had, more, had, had enough to eat, filled their bellies on the sixth day and on the seventh. God gives the people everything they need to obey his command for Sabbath. That's what's happening there. Do you realize that? Like if you're, if you're having trouble kind of following the, like why all these things are together, manna, the bread, provides the means by which Israel can obey the command to rest on the Sabbath. Still, some of them go out and try to gather on the seventh day, don't they? And God says in verses 28 and 29, which we read, How long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? Pay attention to these words that God is about to say. See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. He's given you the Sabbath. It all comes to a head right there, guys. He's given you the Sabbath. It's a gift. 
It is a gift that to be received from the hand of the Lord. But the patterns of sin and unbelief ran in, in Israel so deeply that they eyed uh, God's gifts with suspicion. The bread might not be there tomorrow. So i got to get as much as I can today. The God says don't go out and, and gather today, but... I mean, I gotta have, I gotta make sure that I have enough. On the sixth day, God gave all his people needed as much as they could eat so that they would experience rest on the seventh day. God gives what he commands. But still, the people chose a starvation or orphan mentality. Can understand why. We do the same thing. I have to get all I can and keep it for myself because I'm on my own out here in this wilderness. Have you ever felt like that? We do the same thing. Sin is not just the, the, a collection of, of, of individual outward acts. Sin is the corruption of our, of our thoughts, our desires, our affections, of our very hearts. So that we don't recognize God's gifts as good when he gives them. Basically, sin has us continually trying to hedge our own bets. And far too often our initial response is to believe instead that we are abandoned. And we respond to God that way. We grumble. I want to continue to draw your attention. God gives the gift. He rains bread from heaven so that in obeying, that, obeying God's command to receive that gift, he provides all they need to obey his command to rest. He uses his gifts to, to cultivate faith and trust in his people but we can't, we can't receive the truth of God's gifts if we're not going to receive them on His terms. We receive God's grace. We received His gracious gifts as provision for obedience for what He commands. And it's in obeying that we begin to see God as He really is. We begin to experience it. You can't... How could you know God as the one who gives rest unless you obey the command to rest? But how can, you, how can you obey that command if you're trying to provide something for yourself that God has already provided? You'll never know God as He is if you won't obey Him, but in order to obey Him, you have to believe, you have to, have a, you have to even grow in a firm conviction that He desires to do you good you're not going to obey him if you don't believe that god rained bread from heaven to give everything israel needed to obey him so they would experience rest even in the wilderness even in the desert land but they could only obey him and experience rest on the seventh day if they obeyed him and received from his hand on the sixth day I want to I just assure you here that I'm not just being clever with how we're reading the Scriptures this morning. That this is, that this is really here. And, to, and for that, I, wanna just, just, I want you to just listen to what Moses will say later in Deuteronomy 8. He declares the reasons God gave his, the people manna. And this first part is going to sound really familiar for those of you who have read the gospel. He humbled you and he let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that a man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of God. God's word is our greatest need because God is our greatest need. But just a few verses later, you may have never run across this. God fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he may humble you and test you, again, drawing out the truth of your heart to transform it, 
to do you good in the end. That is precisely why God gave manna. To do his people good in the end. These gracious gifts of God, they wake us up out of a partial faith and obedience. He doesn't just lay down, God doesn't just lay down a command and walk away and say, hey, good luck. But that's how we treat his commands. Because we, we fail, I think it's a lot of times because we fail to grasp that, that he commands us to do good to us. How good and holy must God be to do those kind of things? How faithful, how loving, how, how beyond anything else that we know must God be to act like that to those who are ungodly, to those who, who grumble and say the worst things about him? How great must he be to do these things so that we would know that he is our greatest need. And he means to do us good. We have to come to believe with a steadfast, firm conviction that God is good and that, that he means to do good to us. That this is his, the, his very heart. But we're not going to know that without believing his word and obeying it. Because we'll never experience it. And that's what we need to know. We need, we need to walk with God to experience that, yes, indeed, he intends good to us. Because we always have this voice in our, in our, in our heads going, no, he doesn't. Hedge your bets. You can't know God as he is without receiving gifts from his hand. On his terms. And for your good. I cannot overstate the importance of knowing this and having this conviction. I said, I said earlier, I, as I said earlier, more and more of the world around us actually questions whether our God is good. Not, not just whether he exists, but is he good? And, and that more and more will be the thing, Christian, that you will have to answer to. We must grasp hold of it in the specifics of his word, believing him, obeying him, and experience the very heart of God in all of it. And, I, and, and to that end, we have a gift for you this morning. As you leave here this morning, I know that some of you already have it, but there's a book at, at the doors here. And there's plenty of them, and if we run out, we have more. I want each of you to grab one. It's called Gentle and Lowly. And, it, and what it does, the, the, the great thing about this book, I know that the, the ladies on Tuesday night are already going through this. And ladies, and, and ladies, if you're not part of that and you want to be a part of that, um, go see Marilyn. She's got her hand raised right there. Um, we, we want you to be a part of that. But the, the great thing about, the, about what this book does is it actually points us directly to Scripture, specifically to Scripture, so that we, we're, not just, we're not just off with these, these kind of quasi good feelings about God saying saying yeah I, I believe that God God wants us to do wants to do good to us but he's actually we're actually pointing our finger at his word saying this is the heart of God from his word and so I commend that to all of you and so uh, ladies if you if you have opportunity on Tuesday night to join in do that but I also invite you not to just to to read this but not just read it alone Grab another person or gather a group of people, have them over for dinner, and talk about it. Like you're, you're, you don't need anybody to gather you, to, to do that for you. I invite you to do that this morning. Invite other people into your lives and really focus in on what the heart of God is for you. It's gonna ch it'll change your life. It'll change our lives. It's so important that we know this and we, we experience this as a congregation so that we would, we would have something to declare to our neighborhood.
That would sustain us when, when things get hard in, in direct relationship with another congregation in our building. Or when we have, when we have real hard stuff happening in our, in our lives. And I know that so many of us do. All of us do at one time or another, but so many of us are going through it right now. Heartache, suffering, affliction. It's easy to think God doesn't mean good for you. God doesn't intend that for you. That God's, God's heart must be, must be some other thing. But you need to hear his heart from his word. And so please grab one. If you don't have one, it is yours. Again, if we run out, um, Joyce will go to the, to the office and she'll bring out a whole other box of them. We want you to have this. God means to do his people good. He gives what he commands. And so with, there's a very famous line from a very famous Christian who prayed, God, give what you command and command what you will. Because he commands, he gives what he commands, we can with confidence say, God, command as you will. He is good. He loves you. People, he loves you. And you need him. He's your greatest need. God, you are our greatest need. You fed your people in the wilderness with bread from heaven, and you have fed us with your, your word. You've fed us through your spirit on Jesus Christ. And Lord, as we, as we consider these things and move towards your table, we also, we just recognize more than ever what your very heart is. You are just and a perfect God. The only place for us to find who you truly are is by, is by, walk, is by moving towards you and, and receiving what you have to give. Sometimes we get willful and rebellious. Sometimes we get confused. Sometimes we just don't know which way to turn. So Lord, we ask that you would continue to turn our hearts and that you would let this truth about who you are grow in our lives. That would form us. Form us as a congregation. Form us as your people. That we would, we would glorify you. We would truly glorify you not just in this place, but in this neighborhood and in this city and across this world. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. As we move into, as we move towards the table, I, I just want to read to you from John chapter 6. Jesus, by the way, in John chapter 6, Jesus had just fed 5,000 people with a lunchbox full of food. And they all ate to their fill. Each as much as they could handle. And they had leftover. And then Jesus kind of, then Jesus disappeared for a while and those people all went and caught up with Jesus and this is what they said to him. What must we be, what must we do to be doing the works of God Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him and, and whom he has sent. So they said to him, then what sign do you do? <laughs> That's funny, isn't it? Just fed him. Just fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two, and two fish. What sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses that gave you the bread. It was not Moses that gave you the bread from heaven. Still, as they're talking to Jesus, they're making that, they're confusing that. It wasn't Moses that gave you bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and do not believe. 
All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Jesus Christ is the bread of heaven. He is is the God raining down gifts of grace upon us. Jesus Christ, it's not just just this body of doctrine that we have, not just this teaching. It is Jesus himself who invites you into his presence. And that's what we are face to face with when we come to this table. He is the bread of life. He is our greatest need all the time. Without exception. It's only in trusting Jesus. Only in coming, obeying Him by coming to this table that you can know the heart of God. Only by obeying Him and coming to the table where Jesus Himself feeds you. Can you know the heart of God? Faith leads to obedience. Obedience with the help of the Holy Spirit and that that obedience leads to fruit, bearing fruit in our lives. And that fruit bearing leads to a greater faith and leads to more spirit-led obedience which, which leads to more fruit. Only by obeying, on the, by gathering twice as much on the sixth day would they experience and be able to obey God to rest on the seventh. That is how God works. How mighty, how awesome must he be? And he is, at, he is telling you, commanding you today to come to his table and experience all of this in Jesus Christ. This is a feast of remembrance, communion, and hope. We come remembering that Jesus Christ perfectly fulfilled the law even to, even to death on the cross. And because he did, you are accepted. You can never, ever be forsaken because he will never cast you out. And we come to commune with this Jesus, the bread of life. Jesus is the bread that nourishes us. Jesus is the vine that we have to, uh, we have to live in, we have to abide in if we're going to bear fruit. The Holy, this is the work of God. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. Binding us together, making us one people in Christ's love and in affection for, in affection for one another. So, sinner, you come to this table not making yourself right, but being being called right by God because of Jesus Christ, made one by the Holy Spirit. And this is a feast of hope because as surely as you taste the bread and taste the cup, our Lord will return. And he will raise us up and we will be like he is. This is the Lord's table. You are invited, all who have repented of their sin, and have turned towards Jesus and, and live by His Spirit to, to obey His commands. All, all, if that describes you, you are invited to this table. You are actually commanded to this table to come and experience that the Lord means good to you. It's the Lord's table, not mine. The way we do this is just... Uh, get up, go towards the center, and then come around the edges, and the, the elders will, will serve you. Um, after you have received from the elders, please go and s- take the, the bread and the cup and sit back down, and we will receive all together uh, the, Lord, the goodness and the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. This meal is the gospel, by the way. If that's not you, if, you, if this doesn't, if you're just trying to figure out who God is and who Jesus is, man, I'm so glad you're here. You are welcome all the time. It was, I wasn't kidding when I said that you weren't here by accident. 
and that you are welcome and you are wanted, but this table isn't for you yet because there's only one way to come, and that's God's way, and that's in faith in Jesus Christ and him alone. So we just ask that you would pray and ask God to, to reveal himself to you. Know that we are praying with you and we love you and we're so grateful that you're here. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, our Lord took bread. After giving thanks and he broke it and he said, this, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And on the same night after they had eaten, he took the cup and he blessed it and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for many. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. People of God, you are invited to this table to know and experience the goodness of God and the goodness he has for you. Come when you're ready.